in the sense that um, to the extent that we can think of a black hole from the point of view of an exterior observer um, as some, uh, some system uh, into which uh, matter falls, and from the point of view of the exterior observer, it gets effectively flattened onto the horizon and ultimately later radiated away. And so there's some kind of dynamics uh, that relates the infalling matter to the outgoing radiation. We, we're not going to really know what it is, but we're going to just see based uh, on some sort of uh, schematic properties of quantum information whether just from what we know about quantum information that might provide some, uh, some understanding, some limits on how long we would expect information to be trapped on uh, on the horizon. But it's really going to be quantum information today. Okay, so we ended uh, last lecture with this picture. Um, so the vertical axis was the the entanglement entropy of the radiation or a state that was living uh, in some bipartite Hilbert space I'll just be getting labels, black hole and radiation. Uh, and this was CB, tensor CR. Um, the whole thing had some total dimension E. So if we put a bar on the graph at one half log D, another one at one half log D, and plot, well, I guess we have everything we need for our plot. What we saw last day was that the entanglement entropy had this property that it climbed, uh, it climbed with a slope of one, and then uh, basically at the midpoint uh, it, it goes down again with a slope of one. And when I, this isn't just sort of uh, a, a, approximately, well, it, it is just approximately a tent map, but it's extreme. This is an extremely good approximation that up until you get within uh, you know, very, very close to this midpoint here, we just track the straight line. Now, the message was that. On this upslope here, phi rad was featureless. And uh, let's just take a moment to quantify what I might mean by that. Uh, that I can define sort of an ad hoc information function, which is just going to be the difference between the entropy of the maximally mixed state of the radiation and the actual, the entropy of the actual state of the radiation. Right? Uh, and what we see on this graph is that uh, until the midpoint, of course, the, the actual state of the radiation, uh, or its entropy, is very close to the entropy of the maximum mixed state. And so this information function uh, is essentially 0, and then it climbs with a slope of 2. And one of the reasons this is interesting, and again, this is going to come up in your tutorial, is that this dis difference of entropies looks like a very ad hoc uh, function. But it is a special case of something called the relative entropy. In this case, the relative entropy between the radiation and the maximally mixed state. And well, here I'm being a I, I'm, I'm being even more toy than uh, uh, than the thermal state. I'm going to talk about sort of an example where we could use the thermal state in a moment. Uh, but this is like the infinite temperature state. And this, uh, yeah, just uniform. Um, so d of rho sigma is just defined um, as the trace of log rho, uh, of rho log rho minus log sigma. And it has the property that it's greater than or equal to 0 with equality if and only if. Rho equals C. Right, so this relative entropy, the way that you can think about it, it really is a measure of the distinguishability between two states, rho and sigma. Right? Uh, and it can be interpreted in terms of the, uh, the asymptotic rate of decay of, of some kinds of hypothesis tests. But um, for our purposes, this is really all you need to know. It looks like a pretty good measure of distinguishability. And so up until this midpoint, the distinguishability really is uh, essentially nil. Um, so does it actually define a metric? It does not define a metric because it's not symmetric. Okay. Um, but we're going to define, uh, in, in short order, a measure of distinguishability, which is a metric. Um, and we'll relate it to this relative entropy. Uh, in your tutorial, you'll do some little calculations uh, that are kind of cute. That uh, 
you could, the, the, free, the free energy is actually a special case of relative entropy. Uh, the mutual information function is a special case of relative entropy. And so this, this function actually captures a lot of you know, uh, more than you might think it does. So that's relative entropy. Now I should say, actually, um, that much of what, uh, like sort of some of the technical statements that I'm going to be making, especially if I don't prove them in, uh, during the lectures, uh, you can look this up in this book by Mark Wilda. It's free. It was just published by Cambridge University Press, but you can find it on the archive. 11, 6, 14, 14. And so I'm going to have the le my lecture notes stand here. Uh, and the lecture notes actually have detailed re uh, references both to you know, sections and theorems in the book and to other places that will elaborate on the kinds of things that I'm talking about here. So if you want to, if you want to look, learn more about the kind of stuff I'm discussing, then that's the place to look. OK, so uh, this was a very toy model. And there, there was the question, is this thermal state? And the answer is no. So I just, uh, partly because there were some questions yesterday along these lines, I'd just like to show how this kind of idea can, does extend properly uh, to a setup that might be a little bit more feel, physically realistic. So, so now we're going to have some <coughs> subspace C in a tensor product Hilbert space. And I'm using different, different labels a little bit just to get away from the radiation black hole kind of language. So let's just say that we have a system. We have an environment. And we have a constraint. Like so. OK? Uh, and so you might imagine that the constraint is that the, uh, the, that the, that, uh, the state is going to be in some, uh, in the span of uh, some energy eigenstates and a small window of energy uh, for your system, in which case, uh, well, that, that's one way that you could, uh, you could use this constraint, but you might have other constraints. And so instead of just talking about a general state in the bipartite Hilbert space, uh, 5 H black hole and H radiation, uh, we'll talk about this situation here. Right? And the standard way that you would uh, sort of derive stat mech uh, Omega, which is uniform on your constraint space, right? So you, you, you set some uh, you have some macroscopic variables, you, you set their values, and, and then you say, well, aside from that, I'm ignorant, and so I'm going to use a microcanonical assumption and say that the state is just proportional to the projector onto the, the constraint subspace. So projector. and dimension. Right? And so this is, this is what you do to derive stat mech. Uh, and then under reasonable assumptions, if, uh, if E is large re relative to S, uh, then you can calculate that this omega is going to be the canonical state, uh, for example. Um, but we're interested in a situation where the overall state of the system really is pure. right? And then the question is, can you learn anything about the overall state of the system, uh, well, I should say system and environment, by looking at the system alone? Right? That that's the analog of the question, or it is the same question that we were looking at right here. Right? And the message that I wanted to get across was that uh, if, the system is, uh, if the system is fairly small relative to the environment, and even actually can be quite substantially large, then you don't learn anything at all about the identity of the actual state. And so let's modify the usual statistical me mechanical approach and let's consider some quantum state phi uh, just in the constraint state, constraint space, uh, and let's say that it's typical. <coughs> and to analyze that, we'll just say, okay, let's look at the uniform distribution over states uh, in this constraint subspace. And the question that we're, that we're interested in, that's the analog of this, uh, is the question, is the, the reduced density operator phi s 
approximately equal to uh, the system density operator for this microcanonical state. Right? Uh, and if it is, then by looking only at the system, we can't learn much uh, about, uh, we don't get any information about the identity of the actual state in the subspace. Um, so this gives me an excuse to now introduce a little bit of technology. Right? This, the, the tour of quantum information tools uh, motivated by other questions. And so we need to make sense of what approximately equal means. By yeah. omega sub s, do you mean the same thing as omega here? Oh, yeah, sorry. So, uh, so what I mean by phi sub s is the trace over the environment of phi and same for omega. All right, so if I just put the label on, then I'm just taking the state and I'm restricting uh, to the uh, to the subsystem. Okay, uh, so to answer this question, we first have to be more careful about defining what we mean by the question. So, and here we'll get a metric, right? So a metric for distinguishing quantum states. So we're going to introduce what's called the trace distance. So T of rho sigma is going to be this norm difference of rho and sigma with respect to the Shatten L1 norm. So what is the Shatten L1 norm? Uh, the trace of the square root of x dagger x, which can also be written as the maximum over say y uh, this operator norm is bounded by one of the trace of xy. Okay, so this is uh, this is a norm. We're only using it in the, in the permission case. So in the case of permission operators, what this is, it's just the sum of the absolute values of the eigenvalues of this of this difference, right? So that's that's what this thing is. Um, and you might think it's you know this is kind of okay. Well, who cares? So you just you know, there's some random random norm that you've defined, but this is really the correct norm of statistical distinguishability for quantum states, right? And uh, and I'd say it's, kind of, it's the unique one, right? Like you might be inclined to write down the L you know the, the the L2 norm. If you work with the L2 norm, it's yeah you know, it's very badly behaved from the point of view of quantum information theory. This is the norm that you should be using. Um, and I'll just tell you a few of the properties. Clearly, it's zero if it, you know it defines the metric. Uh, so it's clearly zero if and only if rho is equal to sigma. Um, but more interesting properties, let's make sure I remember what I wanted to tell you. Um, so let's relate it to the relative entropy first. Uh, so one half T of rho sigma squared is bounded above by the relative entropy. So I'm going to be telling you about different ways of distinguishing quantum states, then I better at least to tell you how to relate them. Um, another useful property, again, if you're talking about the distinguishability of quantum states, uh, if I have a state on A and B, or a pair of states, then I should be able to distinguish them better by making use of both systems A and B than only A alone. Right? So there should be a monotonicity criterion. Uh, and that holds. So D of rho AB, sigma AB, or not T. The trace distance between a pair of bipartite states is at least as big as the trace distance between their restrictions to subsystems. Um, and this, for example, fails for the L2 norm. Right? So uh, any measure of distinguishability should certainly satisfy this criteria if it's going to be at all operational. And the third one, again, I don't know how much time there's going to be in the tutorial, but the objective is for you to prove this. Um, this is really, this T can be interpreted very operationally, right? That you can relate T uh, to the probability of making a mistake when given rho and sigma, uh, you, you design the optimal measurement for trying to tell them apart, right? And so T of rho sigma is equal to 2 times 1 minus twice the error probability. 
что the error is the minimum over all measurements. of the probability of making a mistake. Uh, incorrectly. Uh, identify. <coughs> rho and sigma. So I'll define, you know, in the tutorial, this is defined a little bit more precisely. Um, but just to, to get a sense of how this works, if your error probability is 0, you should be able to uh, distinguish these states uh, with, with no error. right? Uh, and when are you going to be able to distinguish two density operators with no error? Uh, if they're orthogonal. Right? And in that case, this trace norm, uh, when you evaluate it to some of the absolute values of the difference, but if rho and sigma are orthogonal, then you're going to pick up a trace of 1 from rho and a trace of 1 from sigma. Right? Uh, and so. Uh, By orthogonal, you mean they are actually pure states? Which use the Hilbert Schmidt inner product. Uh, like the trace, the trace of rho sigma. Okay. So if the trace of rho sigma is 0, you, you can actually really tell them okay. apart. You can, you know, they're projectors. Uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, there's an observable that will give you plus 1 for rho and minus 1 for sigma. Always, always getting it right. Um, now, if you can't tell them apart at all, right? so if rho is exactly equal to sigma, your probability of error is not going to be 1. It's going to be 1 half, right? because you can always just flip a coin and guess. Right? So in that case, you're going to have 1 minus 1, 0, and your trace distance is 0. Right? Uh, and so this trace distance really is just another way of repackaging the probability, the, the, uh, your, best, uh, your best strategy for distinguishing rho from sigma. And so that's, that's why I like it. Uh, and just uh, you know, to draw your attention to things a little bit, uh, I'm just making your life easier, um, but in the tutorial today, you might have to use something like this. Um, you're going to try to prove something like that. Uh, and I guess you need this definition. Yeah, so Question. keep these in mind. I'm, yeah. I'm just confused about number two. Uh, you're saying rho AD should be farther from sigma AD than rho A. What if I'm rho AD? So uh, T is really a distance between states, yeah. right? So how distinguishable they are. Yeah. So if you have access to more degrees of, of freedom to distinguish them, then they should look more distinguishable to you. Okay. Yeah. So that's the the direction of the inequality. Okay. And just remind me of the notation rho sub A B means. Oh yeah. So it, I mean, sorry about that. It's the same kind of thing as this. Uh, so rho A B. Is just a trace over A. Oh, uh, sorry. Say rho, rho A is the trace over B of rho AB. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, from now on, I'll just use that implicitly, but thanks for asking. I want to make sure that people follow my notation. So when sigma equals rho, you, you have B L equals half? Uh, yeah. What does that mean? Uh, well, that means that your best, your best strategy for distinguishing rho from sigma is to flip a coin. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because they're the same state, so they're indistinguishable. Um, so if, if someone, you know, if, if they didn't tell it well, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, there's no information uh, about the identity state when, of the state when someone actually gives you a physical system in that state because the states are the same. Uh, OK, so now in terms of this, was there a question? Yeah. The expression for this PRF Yeah. Oh yeah, so during the tutorial, uh, I mean, we have this written out, like, uh, I spell it exactly what I mean by P error, but probably better to have it, to look at it then than now. Um, yeah? The whole setting is finite. Uh, right now it is, yeah. Uh, this one can be generalized. Uh, but um, throughout, yeah, so let's just say throughout the lectures, I'm going to restrict to the finite dimensional setting, and then you know, the, the analytic niceties are, yeah. Can be ignored, but the conceptual, uh, the w the way that the, the that these these functions and the uh, 
the, the conceptual relationships that I want to expose are, are all there. Um, OK, so now we again want to answer this question uh, in terms of the trace distance. How close is phi s going to be to omega s, right? Like, if you want to think in terms of stat mech, how far is a typical system environment state subject to our constraints to the canonical state? And I'm just going to quote a result. Uh, again, the reference is in the notes. So this is Popescu et al., 2006. So the probability, if the state is selected at random, that the trace distance between uh, the typical state restricted to your system, is it a canonical state, the probability that that's larger than epsilon uh, is going to decay extremely rapidly. So a constant d constraint and then a delta squared. Uh, so this is going to be a very concentrated distribution. Right? That as the dimension gets large, uh, the probability of a significant deviation is going to be small. Uh, but you see that I have a delta and an epsilon. So what, what is the relationship between these two things? So epsilon is my delta, uh, but I can only make it so small. All right, so if you remember over in this picture, uh, the, the reduced state of the, call it, system here is close to uh, the canonical state, the maximally mixed state, uh, up until, uh, call, we call it, you know, up until the system becomes too large relative to the environment, right? And so here we have to say that the, the system should be small relative to the environment uh, so that this quantity, uh, the ratio is small. In that case, we can make sure that the trace distance uh, between the canonical state and the uh, and the typical state um, are small. What is DC and DS? Sorry? DC. What is DC? Oh, DC. So it's this dimension here. Oh. Yeah. So and, and I will just use that notation. I think from now on that if I if I write D sub something, so it just be the dimension of the associated Hilbert, Hilbert space factor. So what do you mean by S? What is, so this is the. Oh, so, so that's fine. So that's one system, right? Yeah. So yeah, uh, the inequality should have to be yes. Ah, um, no. OK, so this is a, this is a good point. Um, so th this is the manifestation of high dimensional measure concentration, right? Uh, that if you choose some, you know, if you say have a, a random vector in high dimension, you evaluate some function of that vector, it's going to concentrate. Um, and you know, there are very general theorems about this. Um, but the, constant, you know, the strength of the concentration is control, controlled by uh, the dimension of the space in which you're choosing the vector. And here, we're choosing the vector in the constraint space. Right? So the concentration is controlled by that dimension. Um, and I should just write in here, I said it's not DE quite, but DE effective. So DE effective is 1 over the purity of omega E. Right, so if you remember last day, the, the trace of a density operator squared, it was this quantity that ranged between 1 and 1 over the dimension of the space. Right? So this can go from 1 if omega E is pure, all the way down to 1 over the dimension uh, of, of E if E is, is uniform. Right? Um, but generally speaking, uh, even in weakly interacting systems, this ratio is going to be very small, provided that uh, the system is small relative to the environment. Uh, and so all that to say, yeah, you know, this super toy model that where we actually you know, did, did the calculation explicitly, um, it is not grossly misleading, right? Uh, that again, very differently than uh, class, you know, uh, the classical setting. Um, if you have a, you know, just imagine a system that starts off in the, you know, somewhere in this constraint space and evolves and hopefully you know, in a, in a non-integrable way and gets to a generic position in the constraint space, constraint space uh, then nothing you can do. Is going to learn, you know, tell you if you only have access to the system. It's going to tell you anything uh, about what the actual state is. Uh, it's very quantum mechanical. Um, yeah. How does when you say omega e, there is something different. Oh, so omega e is the trace of omega over s. So it's 
the restriction to the E system. Yeah, because what you want, uh, like, if uh, if the state is pure on E, then the fact that this is a high dimensional uh, vector space is totally irrelevant, right? Uh, so you need some sort of effective size for the environment. How how much are you filling up the environment? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that should uh, you know, perhaps alleviate some of the fears that uh, that people had about whether we were throwing away too many details uh, to you know for this uh, for this picture to be relevant. But I think that. The, the qualitative lesson that you learned from this picture is okay, and it can be built up, you know, made more robust. Um, I should say, though, again, there was, well, no, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so, now I'd like to talk a little bit about decoding. Oh, I have my picture here. Uh, the idea, you know, what we've learned so far is once we get past this halfway point, it looks like some information, in some vague sense, leaks out. Uh, but uh, for the rest of the lecture, I want to be more precise about what we mean by information leaking out. I want to define an operational task that actually allows us to check to see if some specific bit of information is really present. Okay? Uh, so it's not just going to be some number that we define and see if the number is non-zero. It's going to be really an operational question. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about decoding. I'll, I'll call it radiation, just so that we all sort of agree on the, uh, call it, it's not necessarily a metaphor, but on the sort of the, the rough picture that we're talking about. Um, and here's the setup. So our setup number one. Um, there's going to be some system and some states C, and this is going to be our black hole, which I'll call B. And then there's going to be M for message, some quantum state phi. So M is going to be the message, B is the black hole. And the black hole starts out, uh, we hypothesize, in some known state C. Uh, and then the message is dropped onto the black hole, and then there's some interaction. Right? This is just the naive picture from the exterior of the black hole. Something happens on, on the horizon of the black hole. What is Xi? Sorry? Xi, what is that? This is the initial state oh. uh, of, the, of the black hole before you drop in some radiation. Oh. Um, and then what comes out is going to be some radiation. And there's going to be whatever's left behind in the black hole. So this is our, our very schematic picture of what happens. And there's supposed to be some unitary transformation in between. OK? Uh, and I should put in some sizes here. So I also have B prime. That's also the black hole. So the message is going to be So I apologize, I'm going to change notation a little bit now. Instead of talking about the straight dimension, I'm going to speak in terms of qubits. Right, so the dimension is going to be 2 to the power of the number I write here. So the size of the message is going to be some number k. Uh, so just to make that clear, so the dimension of m is 2 to the k. Not because I have some particular fetish with talking or working with two-level systems. This is just units. Right? But it, it's useful to talk about the logarithm of the dimension rather than dimension. Uh, then I have my black hole. We'll say that's n minus k qubits, so the total number of qubits is n. The radiation, we'll say there are r qubits of radiation, and then n minus r qubits at the end of the day in the black hole. So this is our setup. And what we would like, I, I, I just told you before, we want this to be operational, right? Uh, we don't just want to say, like we actually want to say that uh, this quantum state phi, which is unknown, Uh, falls into the black hole, somebody collects some radiation, and then they can do something. They can act on that radiation 
And out of there should come another quantum state, I'll call it phi tilde. Okay? And what we want is that there exists a D which is consistent with quantum mechanics. such that if we integra integrate over phi, uh, say the inner product between phi, or the, the overlap between phi and the state that comes out, that this should be at least one minus epsilon. Okay? So this is an operational definition of what it means for the information to be transmitted through the black hole. That if you can actually, in some sort of idealized sense, uh, build an apparatus that only acts on the radiation degrees of freedom uh, and have a quantum system coming out, phi tilde, uh, whose overlap with phi is very high, then you have effectively succeeded in extracting uh, the information. Do you mean uh, phi phi tilde phi or just phi phi tilde? Formula Down here? Yeah. Um, so I, I mean this. So phi tilde is in general going to be a mixed state, right? Uh, so the, one way of thinking of it, yeah. Uh, Trace of phi, phi with that. Yeah, so I do mean this. We could also have defined it uh, the following way, since we have, a, we have a, another way of talking about mixed state uh, distinguishability now. We could have asked that the overlap, or the, that the trace distance between phi as a density operator and phi tilde should be larger than, or smaller, yeah, and some delta, some function of this epsilon here. And that, would, that would be equally good. Um, but in this case, because we're just, you know, it's trickier to distinguish a pair of mixed states than it is to distinguish a pure state in a mixed state, right? Because I think that epsilon is a parameter that you set, you know, when, you run, when you're about to run the experiment, right? You say, I want to get a quantum state out uh, that 99 times out of 100, when I perform an experiment on this quantum state that came out of the black hole, I'll get the same answer as if I performed it on the state that I used. If you make epsilon, like the question is going to be, uh, how small can I make epsilon that succeeded this? Right, that, that will be the question. Yeah, exactly. Roughly speaking, you know, on how big R is relative to other stuff. What's the notation phi phi to the phi? This thing here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I should. Maybe this will make it clear. This is a density operator <coughs> up here. Right? So, uh, so phi tilde is a matrix, and then so you can act on the left by, by phi and on the right by phi. Yeah. But is phi tilde like a reduced density matrix that you get tracing? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a density matrix on a Hilbert space, but let's throw in one more system here. Um, Let's call this M prime, right? Uh, so I've run out of space on the board, but M prime is going to be isomorphic to M. Yeah. So this D, this D operation is not unitary because it's changing the, the size of the space. So um, when we ultimately analyze it, we're going to build D out of a unitary transformation that throws some stuff away. Oh, I mean, I'm just saying that, you know, if I wanted to make these two things equivalent, I'd have to figure out, you know, some function of epsilon to... Well, it's not the same thing. No, no, not the same thing. just, okay. yeah. Maybe I'll just call it uh, epsilon prime. <coughs> but I'm going to, I'm just going to cross this out because we're going to use this criterion uh, because... This one's a little bit easier to work with. What does V do? That's an excellent question. I don't really know, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's some mysterious dynamics that describes what happens to matter that falls onto the horizon and then radiates away again. Um, and so that's kind of going to be left open for the moment. But in the spirit of this page type calculation, when we ultimately go and do some, you know, try to calculate ourselves, we'll just say, well, uh, let's just try a V, which is. Uh, drawn from some random matrix ensemble. Um, and we'll use the Haar measure, but it doesn't really matter which one you choose. It's, it's pretty insensitive. Oh. OK. So this is our, you know, so this is model one. 
this high friction chalk. Interesting. The the blue. Uh, <laughs> hmm? I mean, I, I don't necessarily dislike high friction chalk. It's just a, uh, you know, I'm not used to it. Um, since board space is at a premium, I'll cross this one. Okay, so it's now scenario two, which is very similar. Uh, I unfortunately need to take a few moments to draw everything again. Um, ooh. Since I want to leave it up, I'm going to put it over here. Okay, so so far exactly the same, right? Exactly the same picture. Um, and this is a kind of nice intuitive way of talking about what it means for information to be transmitted somewhere, right? That you actually say, well, so I prepare a state here, and the same state should pop out at the end of this process. Um, but what you could do instead, at least in the quantum mechanical context, is imagine preparing some maximally entangled state of M and some system N. So N, which is going to be isomorphic to the message system, is called what we usually call the reference. And let's say that this is 1 over square root of dm sum from j equals 1 to dm j M, J, N. Okay, so instead of talking about actually transmitting a message, what you can do is just say, well, imagine that somebody prepares uh, a pair of particles in a maximally entangled state and drops one of those particles into the black hole. And then the question is going to be, now we're going to look at the state that comes out. So the state that comes out up here, I'll call this the state up here phi tilde. Uh, what we're going to want is just that the overlap between phi and phi tilde, again, there exists a d, should be greater than 1 minus epsilon. Okay? Uh, and so you're not really transmitting a message. Right? There's not some information. It's not as if somebody can uh, prepare a system in the particular state and get the value you know, uh, and get the uh, the message corresponding to which state was prepared to the output. All you're doing is you're uh, you're establishing an entangled state at the output that looks very close to the entangled state that you had at the input. Um, but Does this J refer to some particular basis in M. Um, if it works in one basis, it works in all bases. Okay. So the choice of basis doesn't matter. You don't need to do an integration over the distribution of phi in this case. Uh, this ah ex good. So uh, so why did I want to do that? Like, why did I want to you know, move from scenario one to scenario two? It's precisely because here I have an average. Right? So I have to worry about what happens for a whole bunch of different states. Um, in scenario two, I just fix one state, and I see what happens. Right? And I'll, I'll just say one thing, uh, which is that scenario two implies scenario one. Right? So if you, if you succeed with this entangled state, then you automatically succeed in this average sense. Right, so you sort of eliminate one of the quantifiers by moving to this picture of just sending entanglement. You had a, you had a question? So you're, somehow here you have to be assuming that D takes R into something with the same dimensions as uh, <coughs> Oh, so D, D is going to, is not, well, maybe I should have written it unitarily. It's, it's not unitary. Uh -huh. So imagine that D is going to be some unitary transformation and, and then throw away some stuff. It's extracting the message. It's extracting the message okay. system. Yeah. We want to do this for an unknown capital phi. Um, there should be one D for all. No, this is a fixed phi. You just choose your favorite phi. I don't care which one. Um, so 
uh, and you, you verify that, there was, you know, that you had a D so that you succeeded in this sense. And, and if you verify that, that, that implies that for all of these states of the message system only, or not for all of them, but on, in the average sense, you will, you will do well. Right? So establishing entanglement in this sense is more powerful than communication, or it's at least as powerful. How does that imply this? I don't see it. Oh, OK. So uh, that's not so something I'll have time to prove, but I can tell you intuitively why, it, why it's true. So if you have this system here, right, uh, then at the end of the day, right, once you have phi tilde, you could measure the, ends, the n half, right, just project it into a random orientation. Right? And if you project into a random orientation, uh, that has the effect, since it doesn't matter if you did, did that measurement up here or down, down below, that's this, once you've projected n into a random orientation, n is also in a random orientation. Right? And so what comes out is this whole system acting on some randomly oriented quantum state. Right? And so this has the right convexity properties, essentially, so that, uh, that this inequality carries over uh, into the average that you would have gotten from measuring. Does that make sense? But you want the D to work for all V. But you don't know the V, right? Um, ah. No, the D is not going to work for all V. So in this black hole context, I assume that I know the initial state and I know the dynamics. I know the dynamics. If you don't know the dynamics, you are hosed, right? Like if you don't know what's happening, uh, or I mean, if you ha if you, you you could come up with more sophisticated versions of this, where maybe you know the dynamics uh, in some limited sense, right? Uh, and then you, maybe you can say something, but it certainly won't be able to work for all typical v, right? Because there because the yeah the typical v's. Uh, can be very different from each other. But if I know V, then V is just the inverse of V that acts on C. Right? No, because you're not allowed to act on the V prime system. Oh. Yeah. This is the whole point, right? Uh, that, uh, yeah, that there's a whole bunch of stuff left inside the black hole. Uh, and actually, they, you know, thanks for asking that. Um, the, I, I think, I mean, it, it's it's not at all obvious that this will ever succeed, right? Because you have a pure entangled state. It gets mixed up in some horrible way um, with the original black hole state. And then you lose a whole bunch of, you know, a huge number of degrees of freedom. So that on R, you have a very mixed density operator. Um, and a priori, you would think, well, I've lost, yeah. I've lost so much. I would, you know, a priori, the, you know, the correlations that I need to recover phi are going to be spread between R and V prime, and it's going to be game over, right? And, but what we're going to find, and this is kind of the, from my point of view, kind of the miracle of quantum error correction, uh, is that um, provided R is big enough, despite the fact that the density operator on R is going to be very mixed, you'll be able to find inside that subsystem exactly what you need to reconstruct the, uh, the quantum state. Um, so there, there can be some. Uh, this operator V, which if it's a typical, a typical V, is going to totally delocalize the information, right? It's going to spread it out. So in some operational sense, it makes it maximally difficult to recover it. But by making the information maximally difficult to recover, you also make it maximally robust to corruption. It's sort of a, you know, uh, those things go together. Yeah? What's the difference between a pure state and a product state? Um, a pure state. That's what, that's what the definition of purity is, that the, the density operator is rank one. And product, you know, an operator of a, uh, of a pair acting on a tensor product Hilbert space, and is equal to the product of its marginal density operators. Right? So product means there are no correlations, whereas pure means there's no noise. Other questions? All right. So we are going to go after uh, scenario two. Uh, and to get there, I again have to tell you about some, some basic but extremely useful quantum information. Oh, I'm going to just write in the, the numbers here. So m is k qubits, b is n minus k qubits. B prime is n minus r qubits, and r is r qubits. So 
so the, the sort of major sub major heading here is how can we tell? The scenario two uh, is possible, right? That this that this decoding operation B exists. And to get there, I need to actually tell you just a little bit about entanglement. Okay? So we're gonna have an aside on entanglement. I want you to think about three different quantum states, okay? So the first quantum state is some density operator rho x, uh, which I'm going to write in its eigenbasis. So sum over i, lambda i, e i. So there's my first state. And my second state is going to be alpha on some x, y, uh, and I'll define it as so. And this is a square root of lambda i, e i, f i, and again, the f's are orthonormal. OK? So my alpha, I've chosen it specifically for the sort of obvious property that when I trace alpha over the y system, I recover rho x. Okay, and here's a beta. This is kind of silly, but uh, I'm going to teach you. Or we're going to get to a very important point. And again, the inner product between the G's. Those are also also orthonormal, right? And so my beta state also has the property that when I trace over y, I get back rho x, right? So, so E, F, and G, they are on different Hilbert spaces. Um, let's say they're all in the same Hilbert space. If they were different Hilbert spaces, then you could embed them in the same Hilbert space, which is sometimes useful. But uh, let's, let's say the same Hilbert space. Um, so in particular, we have rho x equals alpha x equals beta x. And pretty clearly, right? Uh, there exists a unitary transformation acting on y alone that will take alpha to beta, right? Because that, you just need uh, to take e, uh, fi to gi, and these are orthonormal frames, right? So you can do that. So uh, clearly, there exists a u uh, such that. Uh, identity tensor u acting on alpha is equal to beta. Right, so nothing very interesting there. But here is a more interesting claim, and one that is surprisingly powerful. Uh, so given any alpha xy and beta xy, such that alpha x is equal to beta x, uh, such a u exists. Right? So here I chose two states, and I wrote them in a very particular form. Or I, I wrote very particular states, right? Because I just, uh, I've paired up left eigenvectors with right eigenvectors, or left, left orthonormal vectors with right orthonormal vectors, and I'm sum summing over a single index. But in general, a bipartite state of uh, the xy system, I'm going to have to sum over indices for both x and y. Right? So this looks like a very special case. So we, in the special case, we argued the existence of u is sort of you know, manifestly clear that it was there. Uh, but if I'm just given arbitrary alphas, you know, why should there be such a u? And I'll just show you why, because it's kind of, you know, kind of fun. So it suffices. to show that alpha and beta, uh, so let's say that, uh, I'll put a star here, um, can be written uh, 
in form star. Okay? Uh, it's an easy linear algebra, but I'll go through it only because the consequences of this fact, I find, you know, they, they surprise me over and over and over again. Right? It's kind of one of the most miraculous little properties of quantum information. Uh, and ultimately, this decoding map D, that, you know, where the, that uh, is this, this sort of the miracle decoding map, you know where it's going to come from? It's going to come from such a U. Right? So that, that's why we're, we're heading in that direction. Uh, okay, so let's think about our alpha. This is going to be the sum over, say, uh, J and K of a, J, K, J, X, K, Y, right? And so I can write the matrix A with matrix entries A, I, J. Um, but any matrix has a singular value decomposition, right? Uh, so what is the singular, va singular value decomposition? You can write A is equal to U D, or I shouldn't use U, V, D, W, okay? So this D matrix is diagonal with diagonal entries that are non-negative. And V and W uh, are unitary. You know, if you don't know the singular value decomposition, this is a really, yeah. One of the most useful facts in linear algebra. It does, a, a doesn't need to be square, right? This, this, is, this always holds. Yeah. Um, they could be different. They could be the same. It doesn't matter, right? If they're, if they're not the same, uh, yeah, then, then D will, will, will not be square. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. Yeah, th this will be a good question. What's going to happen uh, is that if, um, if x and y are not the same size, then um, the, uh, the, the maximum number of dia so diagonal entries is going to be uh, given by this, the smaller dimension of the matrix. Right? Um, and what that corresponds to is that, uh, say, say Say x and y were not the same size. These were constructed such that alpha x was equal to rho x, right? Um, but the eigenvalues of alpha x are the lambda i's, right? So now imagine that y is it, y is huge, right? So when you take the uh, when you trace over x instead to y, the non-zero eigenvalues are going to be exactly the same as they were for alpha x, but there are going to be a bunch of extra zeros there. So that's what happens. Um, okay. Uh, so let's just substitute this in. So our alpha now is the sum over i, j, and k of v, j, i, d, i, i, w, i, k of j, x, k, y. Right? Um, and so I'll just say, this is, by definition, uh, DII, EI, uh, FI. Right? Because what I have here is a unitary matrix acting on the J's, and I have another unitary matrix acting on the K's. Right? So on X and Y, I'm just, my, my, my matrices V and W just change basis. Right? But they change basis in just the right way to actually diagonalize uh, the coefficients out front. And so now I've shown that an arbitrary alpha actually has the special form. And obviously, likewise for beta. And so we can just write down the unitary that's the trivial one that sends one to the other. OK? Uh, Just one quick question. Sure. So, what is your hypothesis that you need for have the singular value decomposition for a matrix? Uh, always exists. For a matrix. Yeah. With positive um, diagonal. Yeah. <coughs> uh, 
because you're only acting by these unitaries on one side, uh, you can you can sort of phase the eigenvalues. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in general, they'll be different. Yeah, um, I mean, clear. Yeah, there, there are some special cases that we're very familiar with, right? If A is for mission, right? You can use uh, one as the adjoint of the other, um, yeah. but um, in general, they're different. So Y and F will be different for alpha and beta. Sorry. Y and F, Y might be different for alpha and beta. The set. The. Uh, the set EI. Yeah. It might be different for alpha and beta. Uh, oh yes, uh, yeah. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a good point. Um, so the set of EIs might be different for alpha and beta, um, but uh, you, you can map them into each other, yeah, into each other without much difficulty, right? Like, um, if there's no degeneracy then the eigenvalues provide a unique correspondence between the two sets of eigenvectors. Right? Uh, I mean, and and if, there, if there is degeneracy, then you just choose them to line up. So, I mean, I, I won't go through in detail, but does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah? For the product stage, like some low x, some low y, Uh, so, so this is this is only supposed to apply to pure states between x and y. So if you have a product state, then you're trivially already in this form. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I already mentioned it, but I'll just uh, write it down because it's sort of useful. Is that to say the the positive eigenvalues? Uh, of alpha x are going to be the same as the positive eigenvalues of alpha y. Right? Um, so bipartite entangled states, entangled states of a tensor uh, of a pair of tensor factors, have this hidden symmetry. That the left side is basically the same as the right side. Uh, and this implies also, just because this comes up a lot, that any entropy of alpha x is the same is an entropy of alpha y. Because these entropy functions always just define, depend on the eigenvalues. Um, and I should have written in, because people, I mean, this is nothing other than the same, this is the singular value decomposition. There's nothing, you know, it's, it, it's it, you know, there's, there's nothing more to it than that. Uh, but this, it sometimes goes by the name of Schmidt decomposition. When people are talking about these entangled states. So that, you'll, you'll see that language. The Schmicky composition is a handy thing. And now we'll get to our super uh, great example. So crucial example. Oh, I've been giving you hints as I go along, right? So now you, this is pro the fact that I'm really enthusiastic about this claim should be hint enough that you should pay attention to it. Uh, when, and when you're trying to do your tutorials. Uh, it, somewhere this is going to come up. Okay. Um, so our crucial example. Uh, we're going to look at this setup. Okay. Um, and let's suppose that V destroys all correlations. between something and something, right? So I'm interested in when we can actually find this decoding map D such that we can get a good pure entangled state at the top, right? Now, if we can do this, right? If the pure entangled state is somehow shared between N and the radiation, then there shouldn't be any correlation between N and the black hole, right? Because you can't copy quantum correlations. This is sort of another manifestation of the no cloning theorem. Right? That if this, if this entanglement is shared perfectly or almost perfectly between n and m prime, there should be no correlation between n and b prime. That's just some intuition. Right? But I'm going to explore the consequences of that. 
So suppose V destroys all correlations between the reference, N, the particle that we left outside the black hole, and the black hole after the evaporation, B prime. And let's write down symbolically what that means. So, IE, oh, I have to put some labels somewhere. So let's call the quantum state at this point up top. Uh, let's call it sigma. Okay? And you'll notice at this point the quantum state is pure. So I can put a kit on it. So I'm interested in B prime N, the reduced density operator, right? So I take the projector for sigma, I trace over the R system, and I get this density operator here. And my hypothesis is that this is equal to sigma B prime tensor sigma n. Right? So uh, someone asked, what is the definition of a product state? When I say destroys all correlations, what I, what I mean is that uh, we've actually just been left with a product state between B prime and n. There are no correlations left. So this is my hypothesis. Uh, or you know, let, let's just suppose that's the, that's the case. Um, so now, Let's compare sigma of, oh, now it's going to be helpful. Again, so I have my radiation system R. Somewhere inside there, I want to find a, another system that's uh, that's isomorphic to the message system, right? So let's just say, let's somehow decompose R as M prime tensor O, where O is for other, right? So this may not always be possible, but let's just imagine it's possible. It's good, at, yeah. The, the technical complication doesn't buy, buy us anything here. Yeah? Uh, when you destroy collisions in deprimed aren't you also destroying collisions in deprimed Because they're perfectly uh, so, if I destroy correlations between B prime and N, you also destroy it between B prime and N, right? No, uh, not necessarily. Because N and M are perfectly integrated. Um, oh, sorry. No, you're, yeah, sorry. You're, no, you're totally right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, because this M prime system, it's essentially a pure state between M prime and N. It can't be correlated with anything else. Uh, this is this monogamy of entanglement. So you're right. Yeah. But once you say B prime and M are uncorrelated, not M prime. Uh, B prime. And N. And N. Yeah. M. M. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, these are systems at different times, right? Uh, so at least with when it, um, at least I, I can't write down a density operator that describes both M and B prime. Uh, so you could talk about correlation functions, uh, but you can't talk about a density operator. Um, so I'm not sure where the what the question was. But. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So we're just going to do this. Yeah. You know, just assume there's there's some such decomposition. Doesn't matter at all how it's done. It, you know, just choose some decomposition like that, and now let's compare our state sigma which is now on M prime O, uh, V prime, and N. And some, I'm just going to say some hypothetical. Uh, let's call it alpha of M prime O, V prime, and N. Um, oh. Well, I'm just going to say for good measure, we can't write this as sigma b prime tensor phi, right? 
that we know what the reduced density operator, operator is on the end system because nothing ever happens there. So I just write it that way. Oh, I don't know if there's any advantage to it. Just have it. So our alpha is going to be phi. So you mean sigma n is equal to phi n? Uh, on the first si line? Sigma n is equal to phi n. Okay. Yeah. Because if I take the sigma density yeah. operator, this one here, yeah. and I look at the end system, uh, nothing has happened to it, so I can just go back to its original definition, and it's fine. Okay. I mean, I, I'm assuming the time evolution is trivial, other than what I've written down on the board. Uh, so phi of m prime n, and then some zeta of what's left, o b prime, where uh, zeta b prime is the same as sigma b prime. Okay? So why have I done this? Uh, let's leave the claim there. So, oops. Uh, then sigma b prime n, by construction, is equal to alpha b prime n. Right? Uh, because if I take my, my alpha state and I trace over m prime, I get phi n. Good. And I trace over O, and I get uh, zeta b prime, but I've just chosen zeta b prime to be some state that is exactly what I need. Okay? Now, I stop, and I ask you, what comes next? If sigma b prime n and alpha b prime n are the same, uh, what can I do with my claim on the board? Prime can be taken to alpha prime. Okay. Exactly, right? So, uh, by the claim, there exists a unitary, and I'll say that it acts on. So the state is the same on B prime and N, so it acts on what's left, which is the radiation, which we've called M and O. So, uh, such that um, the identity on B prime N, this unitary on M prime O, acting on sigma, gives me phi M prime N tensored with zeta of O B prime. And this is exactly what we wanted. Right? Because we don't care. You know, uh, if we apply it, you know, this U is acting on the radiation degrees of freedom. Right? So we apply this U, and what comes out on the M prime system is, uh, well, the M prime system is exactly maximally entangled with N. It's exactly what we want. And then we can just throw away the O system, because we don't care. Right? So, uh, so D, as a map on density operators, D of what do I call a density operator? Rho is going to be the trace of O U M prime O Rho U M prime O dagger. And, and, and it works, right? Uh, and it's done. And so uh, a necessary and sufficient condition Do I go till 4 o'clock? Yes. Okay. So a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of D prime 
is uh, that sigma b prime n is sigma b prime phi n, right? Except that we've destroyed the correlations. Uh, and I like to sort of just, so what I've, what I've taken the time to prove on the board is the, the interesting part, the fact that this is sufficient. And I just waved my hands a little bit uh, about the monogamy and entanglement to say that it's necessary. So if, if you don't see immediately that it's necessary, I encourage you to sit down and convince yourself. Um, but yes, the, I, I like to sort of tell a little you know, parable uh, to suggest why I find this is interesting. Right? So you know, you're, you're driving in your car, uh, and all of a sudden you smell some like really nasty, acrid, metallic, oily smoke. And you think, oh, yeah, this is terrible. I have to go to the, go to the mechanic. Right? So you, you go to the mechanic, uh, and you say, oh, there's something wrong with my car. Uh, it, it, there's this terrible, smoky smell inside. The mechanic uh, sticks his head inside, and he smells it. And he's like, oh, you're right. No, there's something very wrong. But I know how to fix it. And he just rolls down the windows. Um, and he says, done. You know, your car is fine. Uh, and you know, if, if your mechanic did that, uh, then you would, you, know, you would probably not be willing to pay uh, for such service. Um, but that's kind of what's going on here, right? Uh, so we're interested in this nice, clean extraction of this, of this entangled state. So that's, a, that's like a nice running car, right? Um, now, when, when this nice entangled state at the top is not so nice, when there's extra noise, like when there's smoke, right? How does the smoke manifest itself? It manifests itself as correlations between N and B prime. That's a, that's a symptom of something going wrong, right? So one of the, you know, in this case, you just look at this symptom, uh, and you you would, you know, a priori you would think, well, it's not enough to just get rid of this one, you know, this one symptom for you know, uh, for this not working in order to be able to fix the car, to get out the information. But it turns out, quite, I mean, surprisingly in this case, that it that it does. Uh, so that's my my little song and dance about that. Now at the beginning of the lecture, I introduce these measures of distinguishability, uh, and. We want to be able to do this, uh, again, if you think in the black hole setting where there's some, some dynamics, it's too much to expect that you're actually going to have a product state. Right? That's not going to happen. So we need an approximate version. Uh, so if this trace distance between sigma b prime n and sigma b prime tensor phi n is smaller than epsilon, right? right? So if, uh, if in operational terms, when you try to distinguish these things, the probability uh, of being able to distinguish them is small, then there exists this map D such that phi, phi tilde phi is at least one minus epsilon, right? That if it was perfect, this would be exactly one. So the loss in trace distance exactly uh, yeah, manifests itself in a loss of fidelity. Um, and so this is the approximate version. Um, so this uh, hinges on the existence of an alpha? Uh, no, uh, well, it does depend on the existence of an alpha, but uh, it's pretty obvious that such an alpha always exists, right? So phi clearly exists, right? And now we have um, this density operator sigma b prime. Uh, and so you can just write down a state of the type that I chose before. Just choose any orthonormal basis for O, and then pair, pair up the eigenvalue with the, with the eigenvector. Uh, so you were saying this is a miraculous quantum error correction. Where did that come into the picture? Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, what, what, we, what we've actually written down here is um, one version of the necessary and sufficient conditions for quantum error correction to be possible. Uh, and, oh, okay, well, it's, it's worth stopping there for a moment, right? Uh, B prime is our, you know, if you want to think non-term black hole terms, but just something more mundane, it's your environment, right? And you ask, when is quantum error correction possible when no information about the quantum state leaks to the environment? It's if and only if, right? So. This is the statement that no quantum information about uh, about b prime or about n, uh, rather yeah, about your message, uh, has leaked to the environment. 
Uh, and, and, again, and again, you might, well, sort of ob maybe it's obvious in that case that it's necessary and sufficient. I don't know. Uh, I have another question. Sure. About V, what do you need to assume? Like um, so next day, uh, now, so now we have this, this criterion. Right? Now, now, we, now we know when quantum error correction is possible. Then next day we're going to do a calculation. Um, we're going to you know, do maybe more than one. Uh, but I can just write down what we're going to find. So in, this, in the spirit of page and sort of the, the calculations we were doing earlier, um, but also in the hope that it's not drastic, you know, telling us things that are drastically uh, incorrect. Uh, the, un the uninteresting result that we'll prove next day to start is that the, the average over V, where V is, say, the, uh, av the Haar measure um, of T sigma V prime N sigma b prime by n. We're going to square it, because it makes life easier. Oh, it's already there. Is going to be less than or equal to 2 to the n plus k minus 2r. So this is the kind of thing that we're going to show, right? So how do you make sense of this? Well, what is n again? Right? Think of k as the message. So k, or the n is the message, and k, so k is the size of the message. So think of it as small, maybe a qubit or two. Right? So k is some constant. So then n is the size of the black hole, right? basically the entropy of the black hole. Uh, and for this number to be small, 2r has to be uh, a little bit larger than n. Right? We have to be a little bit more than halfway past the evaporation, or halfway into the evaporation process. So this is recovering page. Uh, so R should be bigger than n plus k plus the log of 1 over epsilon over 2. Um, but we're learning more than page, right? Uh, because pa the, the page argument just told you that once you reach the halfway point, some kind of information was leaking out. But we didn't know what kind of information. But this is actually quite remarkable, right? This is saying that once you reach the halfway point, the very particular piece of information that you dropped in that was in no way specially adapted to the dynamics, comes out immediately. Right? That that last bit you pick up is exactly the bit you need to, re to recover your information. And so that, that's some sort of statement, again, about uh, the, these error-correcting codes being robust. Um, but we'll get there. If we only recovered page, it wouldn't be interesting. Uh, and so using this, uh, this method, we'll think about a slightly different version, an old black hole. Uh, and in that case, the amount of time required to decode uh, is going to be independent of the size of the black hole. So instead of having to wait a long time, it will come out more quickly. Now, Question. sorry? You yeah. think that you would need at least k bits to decode m, right? Uh, or this is saying n over 2 plus k over 2. Um, so yes. Uh, it's like if the first I mean, uh, two are not so maybe. Uh, I, I have to check. I, I think when I wrote this down, I was making the assumption that k is smaller than n. Right? So if k is smaller than n, uh, then this is at least k. So, yeah. Also, can I think of the fact that so, so b and m are going into v, and they are getting thoroughly mixed? Yeah. Is that the reason why I can reasonably think of n and b prime to be sort of not entangled anymore? Because m would end up getting entangled with some part of v after passing through v. Uh, After passing through the box, yes. Like, yeah. Those subsystems would get mixed, and therefore, the things that are left outside has nothing to be entangled with. Um, or, or not. It's it's again it's a kind of manifest. I mean the answer is yes, but 
the fact that it happens in this threshold way, as opposed to gradually shifting from one to the other, um, I don't think it is not necessarily obvious. Um, but, I was yeah. just saying, just on the part of assuming that the dynamics is such that N and E prime remain a product state. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this approximate, I mean, the assumption yeah. that T is less than epsilon. Yeah. The fact that that's a reasonable assumption on the dynamics, can it be seen this way that the dynamics is mixing M and B prime? Mm -hmm. So it's ending up unmixing N with whatever it was entangled with. Yeah, I'd say that intuition is fair. Um, I mean, I don't think it, it is yeah. rock solid, but I mean, the, yeah, um, I, I I I agree that intuitively that that's kind of what ha what's happening. Before I let you go, I just want to give you one definition uh, because you're going to need it in the notes. I was going to tell you a little bit more about about it today uh, because it's useful. It'll give us in useful intuition when we do these calculations. Um, but for today, I'll just give you the definition. Many of you probably know it already. Uh, this is what's called mutual information. So we have some density operator, rho AB. Uh, and the way I like to think about this, and I'm not the only one, write a little Venn diagram. Uh, I'm going to define S sub A of rho is the von Neumann entropy of rho A. Okay. So this is this blob on the left is the A entropy. The blob on the left is the B entropy. The whole blob is the joint entropy. Mutual information is supposed to be a measure of correlation. Somehow what, what is shared between A and B. So a natural sort of guess is to say, well, this piece in the, in the middle should be the mutual information. And so the mutual information is going to be uh, the A part plus the B part uh, minus uh, the joint entropy, because you want to, want to cut out the pieces on the side and you double count it in the middle. So this thing has a number of great properties. Um, I was going to tell you about a number of them, but I don't want to keep you. So I'll just tell you one, since you're going to prove it anyways. Although you may not realize that you proved it. Uh, so it's supposed to be a measure of correlation. And what we have is that the mutual information between A and B is equal to zero if and only if rho AB is a product state. Right? So again, you're, you're physicists, so you're used to, to measuring correlation with correlators. Right? Um, but of course, if you have some joint density operator and you happen to choose the wrong, uh, the wrong observables, then your correlators might not detect the fact that the, that the density operator is really a correlated density operator. The mutual information uh, is kind of a universal measure of correlation, right? If there's any correlation at all, it's, me it's measured by mutual information, right? So uh, regardless, of, you know, and then you have to go off and hunt for the appropriate uh, observables that would detect that, uh, that correlation. Sometimes they barely exist, um, but that's what this function is. And next day I'll tell you more about it, and we're going to use it uh, to develop intuition for why things like this formula are true. So I think I'll stop there. And uh, thanks. So um, the question is V. It is just some unitary operator here. We are assuming nothing more than that. For the moment, we're assuming nothing about V except that it's unitary. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we're not even assuming that V is unitary, right? Uh, because all we're assuming, yeah, to, to make this argument work, we just need a state sigma. We don't care where it came from, right? But the dimensionality of the Hilbert spaces must match before uh, and after V. Yeah, so, that imply right, well, uh, preserving dimension does not mean you're unitary. Uh, but let's just say we're assuming it's unitary, because I think that's a fair assumption. But um, 
as long as sigma is a pure state, then what I've written here on the board is fine. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, How can you say it's not unitary? I mean, then the message would get lost, right? If the message is lost, then everything is lost. Um, well, imagine it's a transformation that is maybe a linear transformation on your vector, and it doesn't preserve the normalization, and then you renormalize, and then you end up with a state here. Um, if that state is product in this sense, then this decoding exists, right? Even if it's some very weird dynamics, right? That'd be too good. Uh, I mean, I don't think that, that's I don't think that's particularly interesting, but it's just. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know what to average over. Yeah, um, but just for this formal part here. Yeah. Uh, for this argument to work, it's very important that at this step we have a pure state. Uh, because if we verify that there is no correlation between n and b prime, but there was some other environment where everything leaked out, then clearly we're, you know we might fail in recovering our, our entanglement. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I could. I, we could extend it. Uh, that's fine. I just. Uh, I just didn't didn't happen to. But there, there, uh, yeah. So b, b prime. Continues to exist. A precise measurement on R. On R. After using D. Provided that D exists. D exists, yeah. Um, no. We uh, so anything that we can actually do by acting. I mean, d d is nothing special here, right? D is just uh, in this case. I guess we haven't written it down anymore. But uh, any physically realizable operation that acts on these degrees of freedom, at least in, in this you know, in this sort of simplified picture where the Hilbert space factorizes, nothing I can do to act, acting on R. Can uh, can affect the density operator on B prime, right? As long as the transformation I, I apply on R preserves the trace of the density operator, then uh, it has no influence anywhere else. Um, and anything that I can do in the laboratory preserves the trace uh, because the trace preservation is just the statement that you can serve prob probability. So, yeah. Question: Is it? Always rather standard to construct the Hilbert space for the black hole. However, constructing the Hilbert space in quantum gravity is not an easy problem. Oh, sure. No. So this, uh, I would say, if we had taken more time, like people try to take this notion of black hole complementarity and write down sort of more formal postulates. So it's some kind of semi-classical description, uh, and. I didn't come up with these postulates. Um, as you can see, I'm, 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 I'm an information theorist more than anything else. Um, but uh, this, would sort of, this would be working. Th this kind of setup is consistent with those postulates. Uh, but it doesn't mean the postulates are right. Um, and I think a number of people would argue that the postulates are, don't really make sense. Right? There's, something, there's something crucially uh, incorrect. Um, like the, I mean, I should say that when we first started doing this kind of thing, uh, what we expected to find was say, okay, well, other people out there come up with this idea of black hole complementarity. We're going to work within that framework, uh, and we're going to see whether we reach a contradiction. And we thought we were going to reach a contradiction, right? That would immediately say one of the postulates has to be wrong. Turns out that we didn't. Um, but since then, I think other people have this, this or maybe have this firewall business. Uh, yeah? Here uh, curiosity. So this, this very powerful measures of correlation, for example, mutual information, mm -hmm. or even the entanglement of entropy, are there any ways of thinking of having an experimental measurement of these things? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, it depends what you mean. But something you could do. Uh, So say that you have some, some system and you think it might, it, it might be entangled between A and B, 
right? You know it's a, you know it's a pure state. Uh, and so what you're interested in um, is this density operator phi a. You want to measure, you, you want to get a sense of how entangled it is, right? Uh, and so how might you go about performing that measurement? Well, if you can prepare two copies, identically prepared copies of that, uh, of that system, you could think about trying to measure the observable uh, that swaps them, right? So f is the operator that takes phi c to c phi, right? So the, the swap of the Hilbert spaces. Um, so if you think about the expectation value of that observable, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more yet tomorrow because it's helpful in the calculation. This is the trace of phi a squared, right? So this is the purity. Uh, and so if you can come up with a reasonable way to measure this, uh, this swap operator uh, or as an observable, um, then uh, this, gives, you know, this turns purity into an, an observable quantity. Um, and yeah, there's, uh, there are reasonable ways of doing this in, you know, from the point of view of quantum computation. Uh, and I think people may have even, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think it may be in some small scale uh, ion trap systems, they might have done experiments like this. So, yeah. Okay.